Hello, this is uh, class three of uh, week four, the third class of the fourth week of uh, BPSC 031 Spring Wildflowers, corresponding to April 24th, Friday, April 24th, 2020. And today we're going to talk about three parted, the three parted families in the flora of California. There are a number of families, mostly monocots. Uh, so when we discuss the differences between monocots and dicots, uh, we talked about the fact that um, monocots normally have flowers with three petals or multiples of three, while dicots normally have flowers with uh, five or four petals or multiples thereof. Uh, there is one exception, uh, the family Polygonaceae, which is a dicotyledon, a dicot, and has uh, three petals and three uh, sepals. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, all the flowers that have uh, perianths, uh, corollas and uh, calices in multiples of three, belong to the monocot group. Of these, one of the most important families is the Liliaceae. And uh, I'm making reference to the Liliaceae, what in technical words would mean in the widest sense, sensu lato. Uh, because the Liliaceae is a complex family, very diverse, very heterogeneous, and it has been divided and joined, divided and joined, by taxonomists using molecular technologies or different approaches. Um, and so it's a moving target as we speak. So when I talk about the Liliaceae, we're going to talk about the Liliaceae and allies, other families that have morphologies uh, similar to the Liliaceae. Let me start the, the slide presentation here. Um, with the first group in the, in the three-parted families, the Polygonaceae. Uh, the Polygonaceae is a group of plants that belongs in the dicotyledon groups, um, also known, by the way, as the buckwheat family. Uh, they're mostly herbaceous plants, although there's a couple of examples of uh, small trees. Um, Leaves are often in basal rosettes. Uh, very often the leaves in the stem, when, when they are in the stem, they're attached to swollen nodes. The nodes of the, of the polygonacea are swollen. And sometimes with, uh, covered with uh, papery stipules that are known as ochreas. Flowers uh, in the whole family are normally very tiny, less than two millimeters, pink or whitish, and arranged in dense clusters, or you might recall, we learned uh, the term when we talked about uh, inflorescences, dense clusters or corymbs. Uh, sepals and petals are similar to each other. Um, and when petals and sepals are not different, we call them tepals because they're sometimes uh, very different, difficult to tell apart. And the flowers in some species form Four tepals, they show four tepals, which would correspond to a standard, um, a typical uh, dicot, but many have six tepals, uh, three sepals and three petals in two identical series. Uh, the vegetative morphology of the polygonaceae are herbaceous annuals, perennials, sometimes uh, small uh, woody shrubs. Uh, the leaves can be simple, alternate leaves, um, quite variable, um, frequently arranged in the annual species in basal uh, rosettes, uh, and the leaves with papery stipules that are called ochreas. Uh, the flowers are tiny, pinkish white, I mentioned that already, sometimes also green or brownish or yellow, and group in dense clusters or cymes or spikes sometimes Umbels. Um, sometimes the flowers are inside a, a cup formed by, by bracts, uh, 
that are called involucres. Uh, the perianthus I mentioned is formed by four to six tepals because there's no distinction between sepals and petals. Three to nine stamens, a single pistil, a three-sided ovary with three styles. The fruits are small, usually three-sided akenes. This is an illustration of Eriogonum fasciculatum, one of the most common plants in Chaparral and the hillsides around all the cities in, in California, in Southern California, um, that as the name suggests, fasciculatum, the leaves form fascicles in the, in the nodes of the stem. You can see here an illustration of a flower. Uh, the petals are large, slightly uh, wider than the sepals that, that look uh, narrow but they look very, very similar. You can see uh, the stamens here. They normally have a number of stamens between six and eight. And you can see the ovule inside with the three uh, stigmas coming out. Uh, when I mentioned the plants, you will recognize the polygonaceae immediately. Um, it has, um, a plant called Doc, also known as Doc Sorel or Sorel in the genus Rumex. The smart weed, also known as, as wire weed, uh, that is common in gardens throughout California. Look at the inflorescences. In this case, the wire weed is a dense spike in the in the in the sorrel, in the dock, is is also a dense spike with green bracts that, that cover the flowers. It looks green. Uh, in both uh, the dock and the wireweed or smartweed, you can see the enlarged uh, nodes. And you can see that the insertion of the leaf has this papery, large papery uh, stipule known as the ochre. Uh, the flowers are very, very small and um, normally around one millimeter or, or two, never larger than that. You can see here the three petals and the three sepals forming uh, six tepals. And once the ovary becomes fertilized, the corolla becomes detached and the, and the ovary evolves into a three-sided akene. Uh, you can see here the, the flower transitioning to the ovary growing and eventually the ovary being developed with the akene being detached. There are some important food plants in this group. If you've ever been holidays in the tropics of southern Mexico, the coast of, Bra the coast of Brazil, or any island in the Caribbean, uh, or anywhere in the coast of the Caribbean, the coast of Colombia, the coast of Venezuela, Central America, you will see uh, this, this uh, tree with really wide leaves. Uh, it's a small tree, almost a shrub, I would call it, but it's a, somewhere between a large shrub and, and a small tree uh, with really wide leaves. And uh, you can see the ochre, you can see very well the enlarged nodes and the ochre. The flowers are very small in uh, a racine, in a dense, compacted racine, almost a, a, a spike, but it is a racine. And then when the, uh, the, the flowers become fertilized, the fruit, instead of uh, becoming an akeen, becomes a droop. Uh, it's a fleshy droop with only one seed inside. And it's very nice. You can eat the fruits when you're on the beach. Sometimes you come out of the water and if you see a, a, a seaside grape, that's a common name in English, seaside grape. Coccoloba ubifera, uh, the fruits are very nice to eat. Another common plant in this family is a rhubarb. Uh, rhubarb is uh, basically a leafy rosette. The flowers themselves are very, very small in, in corymbs, and uh, the seed is not really uh, of any culinary value. But the stems, uh, sorry, the, the the petiole of the leaves and the central venation, the midrib of the leaf, uh, can be white or red according to the variety. 
both are very nice to eat. They're very, very acid because they have oxalic acid. And uh, before economic globalization, many years ago when I did my, my graduate studies in the University of Wales, which is a very isolated uh, university uh, village in the northern part of, of Wales in the United Kingdom, in winter there was very, very little uh, fruit to eat. Uh, this is before transportation across the channel started bringing fruits from the southern Mediterranean, Morocco, or Israel into the United Kingdom. And we would have normally a sort of a compote. We would boil the stems of the rhubarb with a lot of sugar because otherwise it's almost it's so acid, it's almost impossible to eat. And you can mix it with cream or ice cream, number of things. It's, uh, it's really nice and was used heavily throughout uh, Europe and also in the United States in winter when there was no fruit and before there was uh, more globalized transportation of fruits. Uh, a very important plant is the buckwheat, uh, Phagoperum esculentum. This is a plant from uh, Asia uh, and uh, it's used to pretty much in the same way that cereals are used. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the seeds look like this. There are three-sided seeds, quite large, uh, three-sided akin, uh, very hard. And you can grind it and make flour out of it. And the flour is used to make all sorts of things in Asia and many other parts of the, of the world. Also in the Middle East is eaten uh, commonly. Uh, and it's a basic ingredient of soba noodles. As a matter of fact, this plant leads me to a discussion on a little box that you will see in the, in the lecture notes, um, which is the subject of pseudo cereals. The name cereals makes reference to uh, the Roman uh, goddess of plenty, of agriculture. She was supposed to be uh, the Roman patron of, of successful harvest. And you can see here, uh, Ceres with, um, with um, um, a, a pack of, of uh, wheat and barley, um, all sorts of, of uh, plants, of well, these plants that we call cereals. Cereals, uh, we will see them in detail, uh, belong to the grass family, to the poesi. They're all in the grass family. And they're grains that, we, that form the basis of our diet. So there are wheats through which we do bread and pizza and cakes and all sorts of things. There are corn with which we do also a pile of, of things like uh, tortillas and, and um, uh, hominy and um, uh, corn flour and corn flakes. Uh, and also uh, in, the, in the cereals we have barley, oats, uh, rye and a number of other cereals of lesser importance. But there are some plants that we use as cereals. One is this plant here, the buckwheat that is used in, in, uh, in Asia and the Middle East uh, in replacement of, of uh, cereals of rice or wheat. Uh, these plants that don't belong in the grass family but are used, the seed is used in the same way as those in the grass family, we call them pseudo cereals. Um, there is a very important pseudo cereal in the Andes in South America, uh, which I'm marking here, which is uh, Kenopodium quinoa. It's a common quinoa uh, that was used since times immemorial by, by the Incas and the Quechua people and the Aymara people in what is now Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and countries associated. Um, in the same way that you would use uh, wheat or, or corn. You can either boil it directly or make flour out of it. And then the Aztecs, and all over Central uh, Mexico and Central America, they, they domesticated this plant here, the amaranth, with which they would obtain also, you can see it's not a grass, all of them, you can see the white leaves with the venation. They're, they're all dicots, they're not monocots. But the seeds in all these plants are small akins that can be ground to produce uh, flour and then uh, consumed. Interestingly, 
it is believed, and there is good evidence, good scientific evidence, that all pseudo cereals, including the one in the in the family we're studying, in the Polygonaceae, the buckwheat, they all originated as as weeds to uh, corn or to wheat or to rice, um, and they became so successful as weeds as weeds that farmers realized that they couldn't get rid of them because uh, they would produce a seed of a similar size to to what they were cultivating in the case of of the buckwheat, a similar a seed that is quite similar to the grain of rice, and they couldn't get rid of it. So eventually, they started cultivating it. Uh, instead of even trying to fight about it, they just gave up. And this gave origin to these plants that are incredibly interesting in modern times as an alternative to cereal cultivation. Another food plant, um, the common sorrel, this, or the small sorrel, which is used in salads. Many polygonaceae are used in, in, um, as ornamental plants. The seaside grape is an important ornamental. Antigon on the coral vine that you might see in the East Coast. It's even invasive in some parts of the East Coast. Some California genera. The most important one in Southern California is uh, the buckwheat, uh, the California buckwheat, Ariogonum fasciculatum. The name buckwheat is given because of its similarity with the cultivated buckwheat, but the seeds in this case are not edible. Uh, the water knotweed, also known as wireweed, uh, polygonum. Um, Polygonum aviculari and lawns, wiregrass, and Rumex acetosella, the common sheep sorrel, which grows in ditches and waterways. Now, let me go to the three parted families in the monocots, which is uh, really more typical the Liliaceae. The lily family is no longer accepted as a homogeneous group and it has been divided by taxonomists into a number of families. For example, the, the agave family uh, has been separated into the family agavesi, including uh, the Joshua tree, the yuccas, which are also included in the family agavesi. And then the onion, garlic, um, and all the plants in that family, uh, in that group, have been separated into the onion family aliaceae. So when we talk about the liliaceae in this class, we're going to be talking about the Liliaceae in the broadest sense, which is a group of families that share a lot of uh, similar traits. Uh, the traits are, in the general, they're often bulb-bearing plants with simple parallel vein leaves, they're monocots, and clusters of uh, showy flowers with six colored tepals and two series of three uh, sepals and seed petals each. The vegetative morphology, mostly annuals or root perennials, with the exception of the agaves that can last for a number of years. Uh, but the reproductive morphology is very simple and very similar. They live for one or two years. In the case of the agaves, they live for many years. But once a rosette is ready to reproduce, it sets a flowering stem and uh, reproduces and dies. Uh, this is Dicelostema capitatum, the blue dicks. It's a pity we're not going to see it in the field. It's very, very common both in the Santa Rosa Plateau and in, um, in Swarthfield Canyon. We see it during our field trips. You can see the flower here with the six, six steeples, three and three. Uh, you can see the general um, shape of a plant with linear leaves, parallel vein, the typical monocot. And you can see the capsule formed by three carpels with the seeds attached to a central placenta inside the capsule. Uh, they're mostly herbaceous perennials. Some are biennials. They live for two years. And the ones that are biennials normally produce a bulb. Um, what else do we have? It includes really important plants like the, in cultivation, ornamentals, because the flowers can be so beautiful, like the lily or the tulip. The ovary is normally superior. Uh, although there's a very related family, the irises, in which the ovary is normally inferior. They're very related, and some even will put the, the irises into the larger lily family. You can see that the ovary eventually has many ovules that are attached to a central placenta, and eventually it dries, and it will dry and form 
a capsule that will be eventually detached. Um, food plants. Uh, in, the, in the family, specifically in the family Aliaceae, there are a number of food plants of great importance including uh, the onion and the shallots, which are in the, in the species uh, Allium sepa, uh, the leek, Allium porum, uh, the garlic, Allium sativum, and uh, chives, which we eat mostly because of the very uh, nice smelling leaves, Allium shrenopraso. Um, the asparagus belong in this in this family, believe it or not, uh, despite the fact that they have these uh, highly pinatific divided leaves that don't look at all like monocots. The asparagus are very, very uh, deceptive, but they are monocots and they belong in this family. You will see in the lecture uh, text I put uh, a discussion that is called Why Onions Make Grown-Ups Cry and Garlic Keeps Vampires Away. Um, and I illustrated that with a uh, Photoshop image of, of um, Charles Darwin cutting onions in the, in the kitchen and crying. And the reason why onions uh, make you cry is because they have some irritating substances called sulfenic acid that acts as a lacrimatory agent. It, it, it will create a huge irritation in, in your eyes and, and, and trigger tears and, and stinging in the eyes. Uh, interesting enough, the bulb of the onion or the garlic normally don't sting if they're not damaged. You have to damage it for it to sting. Because uh, uh, what happens is when, say, uh, the bulb is eaten by a, by a gopher or any burrowing animal, uh, it breaks the cells inside the, the, the bulb and the uh, an enzyme contained in, in the cell gets in contact with a sulfur containing, uh, containing amino acids that are stored in the vacuoles. And, and that, that, re that chemical reaction produces sulfenic acids, which are very, very ir irritating. Uh, what is the reason of this? Why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this and bringing uh, poor old Charles Darwin into, into the subject. Well, sulfenic acids play a role, very important for plants that have storage organs underground, nice, juicy storage organs underground. Uh, they, they deter underground burrowers like, like uh, gophers or moles from eating the tuber. Uh, these little um, burrowing rodents really hate the sulfenic acid in the in the tubers and they, 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 they bite it. If they bite it by mistake, they will immediately go back and, and uh, stop harming uh, the plant. So much so that you might have seen it in, in uh, throughout gardens in, Cali in Southern California. They're very, very common in, um, in campus and in, in UC Riverside. This plant called Society Garlic, which is not in the genus Ap uh, Allium, but in the genus Tilbagia. Tulvagia violacea, society garlic, is planted profusely by gardeners in Southern California as uh, a more in lines. So if you look at them, they plant them in lines uh, as a means to keep uh, gophers away, to deter gophers from eating more valuable plants. Most of the plants in the, in the Liliaceae have some sort of defense. Uh, for example, the agaves all contain uh, these crystals that are needle-like, sharp, sharp needle-like uh, crystals make, uh, made with uh, oxalic acid and store in the leaves. Uh, they're called raffids. That's, uh, that's the name of the, of the crystals. If an, in, if an animal, any animal, especially mammals, eat the, the base of the, of the agave, uh, they will get a huge irritation in their mouth, uh, instant feeling of pain. It's, it's sheer agony because these microscopic crystals get encrusted into the mucus of the animal's mouth, including human beings. That's why we have to cook agaves. That's why, for, for example, in order to make mezcal or to make tequila or to make pulque, any type of, of fermentation or distillation that we do of the agaves, you have to cook them 
very slowly on, uh, for over a day for the raphids to be dissolved with a high temperature and the plant becoming edible. Of course, agaves have an incredibly important role. They are, I think, the second or the third largest uh, export uh, uh, product for Mexico. And there are other countries, uh, South Africa, for example, has started cultivating agaves for distillate with great success also. They make uh, very interesting uh, spirits and, and, uh, and a booming economy. In the ornamentals, you have uh, from the Canary Islands, the dragon tree, uh, Dracaena draco, and some California plants. Uh, the typical Liliaceae is Diculostema capitatum, known as wild hyacinth or blue dicks. Um, there is a dusky onion in the family Aliaceae, Allium campanulatum, uh, that we often see in our field trips. It does smell the minute you crush the leaves. Uh, it smells like sulfenic acid. Again, you have to crush it. The, the leaf without damage doesn't smell at all. The asparagus, asparagus officinalis, which is an invasive, as a matter of fact, in Southern California. It's all over the place. It can be quite invasive. Uh, the golden star, Blumeria crocea, uh, in chaparral, and the blue-eyed grass, Cicerincum, Bellum, which is not really in the Liliaceae, it's in the Iridaceae, which is a related family, but the morphology of both families is so similar that I took uh, the liberty of putting. Look at them. It's three petals, one, two, three, and three sepals, which are slightly narrower, uh, but almost indistinguishable. So they make a continuous corolla of two worlds of similar parts known as tepals. It has six uh, tepals. Uh, the Brodlia filifolia, the three leaf Brodlia, uh, and of course Agave deserti in, in the desert. You need to cross the mountains from Riverside and you will see them in bloom uh, now in spring. Uh, the Joshua tree in the Joshua Tree National Monument. And in, in our own field trips, uh, the yucca whiplay, the chaparral yucca, which is uh, really very, very beautiful. Um, one little anecdote that you might want to explore. Look, look at the flower of the yucca. It's really interesting. It doesn't have a style. You can see here the three carpal ovary, one carpal, two carpal, three carpal, and the, the stigma sits directly on top of the ovary. And look at the anthers. The anthers are sort of wide. They don't have a filament, or the filament is incredibly wide, like the magnolia, for example and the, uh, sorry, the, the stamens. The stamens have a very, very wide filament, and the anthers are here sitting on top of the stamen. It has an incredibly interesting pollination system by uh, a family of moths in the genus Tegeticula. All yuccas are pollinated by some Tegeticula moths, and what the moths will do is they will climb up the filament, that's why they're so, so big, get the pollen, make a little pollen ball, and fly to another flower in another plant and put the pollen in the stigma to fertilize the, 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 uh, the ovary. And then immediately after, they will, uh, with their tail, they will inject a couple of eggs uh, inside. Uh, these, these are the female moths, of course, inside the ovary. So basically, it's, it's one of the most fascinating systems just here in our backyard, in, our, in all the mountains around Riverside, of pollination, in which they actually, the, the, the plant doesn't produce nectar, the, the, it doesn't attract any other insect to pollination other than the tegeticula moths. They don't produce any nectar, and the service that the plant provides is a safe habitat for the insect to uh, insert its, uh, the eggs and rear its, uh, its larvae inside. It's a fine tune, a very fine tune symbiosis, because the insect will only insect one, two, three eggs, normally not more than that. The larvae will start gnawing on, on, on a few ovules or, or developing uh, seeds, uh, and will start gnawing in the placenta, but all the rest of the seeds will be able to survive and eventually set seeds. So it's one case, we did discuss it uh, when we're talking about reproductive morphology and pollination 
the plant actually, this, this, this beautiful inflorescence is pain for babies with babies. In order to be able to have successful embryos, it's uh, conceding part of those embryos to the moth that provides the service of pollination. So this is uh, the last, let me stop sharing. Uh, this is uh, the last lecture of, uh, of um, week four. Uh, next Monday, we're going to start doing some uh, review uh, of, of what we've learned up to now in order to prepare for the midterm exam uh, that is going to be next week. So Monday, we will have a review day. I thank you very much for your attention. I wish you uh, a very nice uh, weekend. Stay safe, take care, and uh, I'll see you next Monday. Thank you very, very much.